You're in the water loop. <laughs> This episode is part of a series, the PFAS puzzle, lessons from a contaminated Cape Fear. The forever chemicals were dumped in the North Carolina River for nearly 40 years before being discovered. The series explores how a community responds when it is the epicenter of PFAS pollution. This episode is about human health. The emergence of PFAS has epidemiologists and toxicologists working to understand the health impacts. Researchers in North Carolina are on the leading edge of the science. In this episode, Dr. Jane Hoppen of North Carolina State University and Dr. Jamie DeWitt of East Carolina University discuss what is known about human health impacts. They talk about studying the blood of people in the Cape Fear region and finding higher levels of PFAS than the average American, communicating these results to people and sharing recommendations for monitoring their health moving forward. Jane and Jamie share what they have learned as researchers and offer advice for other scientists working on PFAS. Before starting the interview, I want to mention that Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet. This series is made possible by the support of Black & Veatch, Ultra, and PFAScoms.com. I will take a few minutes to talk about their expertise on PFAS and then start the conversation. Waterloo. This episode is sponsored by Ultra. When it comes to PFAS, there are hundreds to thousands of contaminated sites across the U.S. and Canada. Military bases, airports, landfills, and industrial facilities are all known locations where the risk of having PFAS is very high. Ultra experts have been performing risk assessments and implementing cleanup solutions for PFAS for nearly 40 years, building a reputation as innovators along the way. The Ultra team is helping pave the way for better outcomes with proven innovations like its patented PFAS technology and first-of-its-kind continuous process. This drive for innovation, combined with its comprehensive suite of solutions and local regulatory knowledge, means customers have the right team to combat their PFAS challenges. Visit Logistech.com forward slash PFAS hyphen solutions. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. This episode is sponsored by Black & Veatch. Black & Veatch is proud to provide the planning, design, and construction services for Cape Fear Public Utility Authority's new granular activated carbon facility that successfully removes PFAS from the Wilmington community's drinking water. Black & Veatch helps organizations across the country and around the world to address their PFAS challenges, providing end-to-end -end consulting, engineering, and construction services to meet each community's unique needs. From applied research to executed projects, Black & Veatch is at the forefront of innovative and effective PFAS treatment solutions, trusted by key trade and research organizations such as the American Water Works Association, the Water Environment Federation, and the Society of American Military Engineers to mitigate the impacts of PFAS in our environment, critical infrastructure, and communities. To learn more, visit bv.com forward slash PFAS. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. This episode is sponsored by PFAScoms.com. PFAS is shaking public confidence in our nation's drinking water. And now that EPA is requiring utilities to test for PFAS, newsmaking findings are guaranteed. Your utility must become and stay the trusted go-to source for information about PFAS in your community. PFAScoms.com is here to help. Their communication experts protect you from threats to your reputation when discoveries are made. PFAScoms.com provides proactive public information plans as well as 24-7 emergency support. Visit PFAScoms.com today to set up your free initial consultation. That's PFAScoms.com. You're in the water loop. One of the biggest questions with PFAS is what are the known health impacts? What can you say about that? So what we see consistently is that people have higher PFAS, whether it's PFOA, PFOS, also are more likely to have higher cholesterol. It doesn't mean all people have higher PFAS, have higher cholesterol, and it doesn't mean it's high cholesterol. But so increases in cholesterol, um, People with higher PFAS um, are at higher risk for kidney cancer, breast cancer, 
testicular cancer. Um, we, there's also evidence to suggest that uh, PFAS um, may influence um, liver enzyme functions. Higher PFAS are related to altered thyroid function. And so your thyroid is really important for uh, all sorts of metabolism. So part of the challenge in understanding PFAS health effects is that their impacts are on these really important systems that, uh, like the immune system, for example. We know that um, people that have higher PFAS will make a, a lower response to a vaccine. You'll have lower antibodies. Again, it, does, it may not mean that you won't be able to mount an immune response when you're exposed to that agent, but at least in these kind of, there, there looks like there's some changes to the immune system and how it responds. And things like uh, reduced fetal and infant growth and um, potentially increased risks of preeclampsia. And so those, I think, capture all of what we in the National Academy reviewed and, and, and ranked. But there's always more science coming out. So you've been studying this for almost 20 years. Where would you say we are in the arc of knowledge or understanding of the health impacts of PFAS on people? Are we still pretty early on? Do we have a good understanding? How, what would you say about that? I think for some PFAS, we, we have a good enough understanding to move forward with recommendations for minimizing or eliminating exposures through exposure re reduction through stopping source inputs into the environment or remediation. But for many, many PFAS, especially those that we found here in North Carolina, there's little to no toxicological data in the publicly available literature. I don't know if there are data available uh, from the companies that made these compounds. If there, if there are data available, I don't have access to them in an easy way. So for many PFAS, we're still at that grow that, that first part of that growth curve. Um, we're not where we need to be so that we can appropriately protect environmental health. The idea that some of these PFAS can go and go into tissue or go into different organs or parts of the body and kind of accumulate there, is that something that's been shown in science? Yes, we, we know from laboratory studies that PFAS like to stick to proteins. Um, they can stick to proteins in our blood. One of them is albumin. It carries things around our body and PFAS like to stick to albumin. And so that's one way that they move around the, the body. They also stick to other proteins. Some of these proteins are in cells. They can go to the nucleus and bind to the DNA and change signals. They can turn off and turn on various signals in the body. And we're still trying to understand why PFAS stick to some proteins and why they unstick and stick to other proteins. I actually have a colleague at uh, the University of Pittsburgh named Dr. Carla Ng who is looking at those molecular protein dynamics of PFAS to figure out why they go here or why they go there inside of the body. And we think that their affinity or how well they stick to different proteins drives a lot of their toxicity. How challenging is it as a toxicologist to study this class of chemicals that has so many different uh, variants, if you will? Well, one of the challenges that we have is that to do an exposure study in the laboratory, we need the PFAS. Not all PFAS are available from vendors. We can't go to you know, the PFAS store and order up PFAS that we need for the laboratory. Um, some can be synthesized, and we've gotten some through chemists who have synthesized. But some businesses that make PFAS have made it very hard for scientists to get PFAS to do lab studies. They've claimed confidential business information and have made it hard for analytical chemists and toxicologists to get that purified product. And another challenge is that for many of the PFAS that haven't been well studied is that we don't know what concentrations to use for exposure studies. So we don't want high levels of exposure that lead to really high toxicity because we're looking for sub-lethal effects or effects that occur at lower concentrations, more similar to what you and I might experience. So there's also challenges with, are we studying the right kind of toxicity? Are we studying the right kind of cells? Are we looking at the right kind of laboratory model? So there's many challenges associated with studying PFAS. So in the summer of 2017, when kind of the news broke about 
PFAS in the Cape Fear River and the, especially the Lower Cape Fear River community of Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, how were you part of kind of the mobilization of the scientific community? What happened uh, in, this, in this state to bring the scientific minds together uh, to, to look at this issue? There were communities within the United States that also were wrestling with PFAS contamination to their water. Communities in New Hampshire and New York, New Jersey, West Virginia. and West Virginia, yeah. yeah, from the C8 science panel studies. And I, I knew there were people getting exposed. I knew there are populations of individuals, and I'd met some people who were advocating for their communities. But it really hit home to me when I went to this meeting in my state, in a community not very far from where I live, and when I, when I looked out into the audience and saw fear on people's faces, that's when I realized that, that my work could have more impact than just scientific publications in various journals. That's where I realized that there were people counting on me to generate data to help decision makers make decisions about protecting their health, not just the health of a community, but the health of Dana and Emily and other people in the audience looking to me to, mm. to, to produce information that would enable them to convince decision, decision makers to start doing something about PFAS in the state. So it, it really became a lot more personal because it's here in my state. This is my home. I'm an environmental epidemiologist with a lot of experience in figuring out how you how you measure things, like because some things you're going to want to measure in blood and water, and so the levels were going to drop pretty rapidly when Keymore's made the change. We were able to write um, a time-sensitive grant to the National Institute of Environmental Sciences um, to do a study, an exposure study, to characterize exposure to um, to these chemicals. And we didn't, you know, at that point we didn't know. If we'd find Gen X, we didn't know how long it would stay in people's bodies. Um, we, we didn't know many, but we knew that we had to move pretty rapidly if we were going to try to catch these chemicals that no one knew much about the human exposure to. For example, because we sh weren't sure how long these chemicals were going to stay in people's bodies. We didn't want to collect samples like uh, over a long period of time. We wanted to collect as many at one point in time because if they were also changing, it would be like, oh, if you were in November and you were December, like it would make it harder to interpret. Um, but we did reach out to uh, people in the C8 study, Kyle Steenland, and got their questionnaire so that we could have that same kind of data. And the C8 study is the Parkersburg, West Parkersburg, Virginia. West Virginia. Yep. We had no idea. We were, we, were, we were chasing this chemical Gen X, this, this fluoroether that um, was uh, discharged to the river by the Keymores facility. And so we were focusing on that, but when we were measuring blood, we also wanted to look at PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, all the ones that are measured in, in people in the, in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey every year, so we would have standard data. And we were totally surprised that the levels in Wilmington were so much higher than the national average at that point in time. What's your general summary then of the PFAS levels yeah. for, for these people compared to the rest of the country? So, right, so one of the first things that we do because it's a community engaged project is that we want to give people's PFAS results back to them. And so we did that um, from October to December of last year. And so um, overall, so we continued to see the fluoroethers, Nafian byproduct 2, and PFO5 DA in people in Wilmington, and a lesser extent to people in Fayetteville. Um, we also um, reported back the legacy, um, which are also the chemicals that the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released values for that kind of health, health appreciate, health health guidance values. And so people who were like above 20 were regarded as highest adverse potential for adverse risk. People 2 to 20, uh, uh, med you know, like some adverse risk, particularly in sensitive populations, and, and then less than two, probably no adverse risk. And those numbers are nanograms per liter or parts per trillion? No, those numbers are, those numbers are nanogram 
per milliliter. So we measure, so blood samples are measured in parts per billion. About 28%, and I should mention that we include kids as young as six all the way to 86. And, and we expect older people to have higher levels, but um, so that uh, about 28% about of the people overall um, exceeded 20 nanograms per mil. So that, so in Pittsburgh, it was 40%. So what I heard was that at that above 20, where you're really concerned about health impacts, 28% uh, in, the, in the Cape Fear region of people exceeded that. Nationally, it's about 8%. Yeah. Since 2000, nationally, the level of PFAS in people's blood have been coming down. And even we see that in our study between 2017 and 2020, the levels of PFOA and PFOS have been coming down. A lot of the chemicals have been phased out. Uh, right. There's still a long way to go on that front, I'll just say. They're still very prevalent in household products, consumer goods, but there has been a phasing out. Right, there has, there has been a phasing out, but you didn't clean out your house when like, oh, PFAS, you know, so you still have the carpet and you still have the couch and you have the dust and you have your favorite cosmetic product that you got on sale and you're not gonna throw it out. What other health studies have been completed or underway or are planned when it comes to the, the Cape Fear region? We have a paper where we're looking at alterations in liver enzymes. We are looking at thyroid disease um, because that seems to be higher among people, among women in the lower Cape Fear. And then in February of 2020, which is an auspicious time, we received additional funding to start a, uh, a up to 20 year study, but a five year study where we would um, enroll people in, in the lower Cape Fear. So at this point then we were able to add Brunswick County to our recruitment area. Um, uh, Fayetteville, the people who live around the chemical plant, as well as Pittsburgh. So P Pittsburgh is interesting because they give us a picture of the people who are only exposed to the legacy PFAS, whereas these other two have this history of exposure to fluoroethers. What's the uh, medical advice, or what's your, what's your advice to the medical community, healthcare providers, uh, for these people? If you're between two and 20, the recommendations are like get routine healthcare, get your cholesterol checked on a regular schedule. If you're pregnant, have prenatal visits to help um, prevent um, preeclampsia and you know help ensure um, good growth. TSH tested, your thyroid stimulating hormone tested, um, and that's a simple blood test. Women should get regular screening mammography so that to pick up cancer early. Um, so most of the recommendations for two to 20 were like standard recommendations, but reminders. And so, um, and so how, how do people get those? And then for the people above 20, then like more, more rigorous, like get cholesterol checked starting younger at age two, uh, get uh, TSH measurement on a regular basis, um, do kind of like, there's not a lot of clinical tests for kidney disease, but for kidney cancer, but um, to like have your doctor check for signs and symptoms of kidney cancer, um, encourage, encourage uh, men, young men, to get screened for testicular cancer, because uh, it's, not, it's not prostate cancer, it's a disease of men like 15 to 40, and so, um, so those, kinds of, those are kind of standard recommendations. As a toxicologist, what information have you been able to relay back to these communities about PFAS and the impacts? In some ways, I feel like I still convey the same old scientific information that I convey to other audiences, like at a scientific meeting. But I also feel like I can say, look, we're studying these chemicals, and what we're seeing is that there are changes to the immune system. So if you're worried about your health, do things that are healthy for your immune system. You know, get outside, exercise, eat as healthfully as you can. Uh, try to you know elevate your mood because that helps your immune system as well so I, I like to think that i'm thinking a little bit more about 
the practical considerations for ensuring that you and your loved ones have a healthy immune system. And I hadn't really thought about that quite as much. Like I'm looking at the stuff that makes the immune system go bad, but I realize I also have to think about what we can do to keep our immune systems happy and keep them doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I also feel like I also now take my science to journalists. I bring my science to people like you who convey it to a broader community. I've also spoken to Congress. I work with various organizations to educate them about the science that we're doing. So I think that the stream of information about PFAS that I convey has broadened. Mm -hmm. So instead of just writing a paper and putting it into a scientific journal, I talk to a lot more people. And so hopefully that means that what we do here in the lab reaches a broader audience and enables them to make decisions based on what we produce in the lab. And what about your scientific colleagues around the country? Have, has there been more engagement? Have, have people come to this area, you know, tried to see what's happening here, other, other toxicologists and so forth, because this is kind of unfortunately a, a model community? So I think North Carolina in many ways serves as a, a good example for how scientists can work together to solve an environmental health problem. The Superfund Research Program Center is enabling scientists to work on the PFAS problem. The PFAS Testing Network is enabling scientists from multiple universities in the state to work on the PFAS problem here. I think we all generally like one another. We get along because we know we're working to improve environmental health. So I think a lot of states are looking to North Carolina to go, hmm, how, how, did they, how did this come about? How can we get scientists in our state to work together on a problem? Any other lessons you've really learned, things that have just kind of jumped out at you during these past five or six years working on PFAS? You've been working on it since 05, but new lessons? I am not a chemist, <laughs> and the chemistry behind PFAS is very confusing. Mm -hmm. So trying to come up with ways to describe the complexity of PFAS but also explaining that, yeah, there's maybe 12,000 different chemicals in this class, but all of these different chemicals are structurally very similar and they have characteristics of concern that make them really incompatible for a sustainable world. Uh, and one of those characteristics of concern is persistence. You know, they're persistent in the environment, they're persistent in the bodies of living organisms. So I've, I've learned a little bit more about chemistry, even though I really didn't like chemistry when I took it in college. I've had to learn a little bit more about chemistry. As an epidemiologist, what, what are a couple of the, the lessons you've learned by going through the past six years of, of studying this? The project has really flipped how mostly I've done science, mostly. Well, because mostly it's like, I have this idea, I want to develop this question, and I work on it and develop the question and try to get funding for it. And, um, and then when I get the data, kind of write it up and think, you know, work on it. And then maybe at the end, share results with the, the community. Uh, whereas this has been like, OK, we have this question, is it in our bodies? What are the health effects? So you know, that we've, I've really like, even writing the proposal, like the community engagement went at the front rather than as an afterthought, which has meant that we're also slower in getting our scientific publications out because if we are committed to giving data back to everybody. So, but another thing I, will, I think is really like a surprise of what we have done is that we identify, kind of thinking broadly, is that we didn't expect to see this super high level of legacy PFAS in Wilmington. And it really draws the question of where else do they have really highly exposed people that no one sampled? You know, the NHANES samples 1,000 people every year, and but they have a, they don't, do a geographically representative sample, they do a demographically representative, which is perfect for their goals. But we don't have a good picture of PFAS exposure in the US. And what advice would you give to other epidemiologists and other communities that might be headed down this road where there's PFAS concerns and they need to study it? What, what advice would you give? It takes a lot of time because 
in this model where you're working actively with communities, we have like a full email, like people email us and people ask us questions. And, um, and so it takes a lot more kind of committed time. Like it, it takes different kinds of time. As other communities around the United States and the world even uh, start to grapple with the presence of PFAS, uh, what what advice would you have to toxicologists in those communities, other scientists, on how they should go about this? So if I was telling somebody who's a toxicologist who's, who's never gone into PFAS before, I would say, well, they're, they're challenging a study because of their chemistry and because of the ability to get them. Mm. But my advice would be make sure that you're studying an endpoint that is going to be useful to regulatory scientists and decision makers. Sometimes when, when chemicals become really popular, you see an explosion of scientific research, which is great, right? The more data, the better. But not all scientific research is going to advance basic understanding of how a chemical works, and not all scientific research is going to be useful for decision making. So I would say, you know, think about what you're trying to understand by studying PFAS and make sure that it's going to advance basic scientific knowledge or and advance what we understand about PFAS hazards so that we can identify those risks and start to implement remediation or regulatory controls. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And thanks again to Black & Veatch, Ultra, and PFAScoms.com for the support of this series. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop.